become interested in aviation? Uh, well, I was a young uh, lad living in Glasgow. Um, my parents had friends in London, uh, and I was invited to uh, London um, for the Easter holidays. Uh, I was 13 at the time. My parents were worried as to how they could get a 13-year-old from Glasgow to London. And then they came up with the brilliant idea of flying me from Glasgow Renfrew Airport to London Heathrow in a vanguard of British European Airways. And uh, that was my first experience of flying. And when I, um, when the aircraft took off from Renfrew and I looked out the window and felt the sensation of flying, I knew that that was the career for me. What year did you join the RAF? Uh, I joined the RAF on the 2nd of January 1969 at RAF Church Fenton, uh, not far from where we are today, near Tadcaster, near York. And um, that was then where they had the Aircrew Officer Training School. Did you always know you wanted to join the RAF? Well, certainly after I flew in the vanguard with British European Airways, I certainly knew I wanted to fly. Uh, I was a cadet in the Army CCF at school in Glasgow. Um, so putting the two together, military and aviation, Air Force seemed like the logical conclusion. What was the process like before you started flying? <laughs> For me, it was um, a little bit awkward. I wasn't the greatest academic in the world uh, at the High School of Glasgow. Um, my headmaster was uh, less than confident that I'd make the grade for um, a career in the RAF. Uh, and so I attended the uh, uh, Officers and Aircrew Selection Centre on a number of occasions, I think three eventually, um, before I managed to convince the Air Force uh, selectors that I should be given a commission in the Royal Air Force and allowed the opportunity to fly. Um, my application was successful for commissioning, uh, but it was unsuccessful to be a pilot. Apparently, didn't have the aptitude to be uh, a good pilot, so they said I'd make an excellent navigator, and wanting to fly, uh, I jumped at the opportunity. What was your first uh, ever flying experience? Uh, my first ever flying experience was in the um, well, it was a flight from London, uh, from Glasgow to London and return. Um, but I also had a friend at school who joined the Air Force about the same time as me. Um, he, was, he eventually became a Phantom pilot, but he uh, had a private pilot's license. And uh, we f he flew me a couple of times in a thing called a Bolko Junior, um, out over the River Clyde and over Loch Lomond and back to Renfrew Airport. So that was my first experience of real flying as opposed to being a passenger in an airline. Was it just um, how you thought it would be? Um, joining the Air Force or fly <laughs> fly <laughs> flying? <laughs> flying, yeah. Um, yes, I think it was just as I, I thought it would be. The navigational training course at RAF Gaydon, where I started out and finished at RAF Finningley, um, was fairly intense. Um, and you couldn't make too many errors and expect to get away with it. It was an intense training course. Um, but thankfully, I made the grade and I got to fly the aircraft of my dreams. What was, what was your first aircraft you were assigned to? first aircraft I was assigned to after, uh, after nav school was the Buccaneer. Can you tell us what it was like to be, uh, to be assigned to this aircraft? Um, well, the Air Force had a system at the nav school where you um, they allocated cockpits that were available. Um, they, at the time when I went through nav school, there were op opportunities to fly on the Vulcan, the Victor, the Canberra, the Phantom, and the Buccaneer. Um, it was well known at NAV school that the top of the course got, if available, their top choice, their first choice. Uh, and those who didn't do quite so well on the training course normally ended up um, on the V-Force in the early 1970s. Um, I had been up to Scampton as part of the course and looked in the back of a Vulcan and seen the black hole with no ejection seats for the crew. 
So when I got back from the visit to Scampton, I thought, you're going to have to work harder, Harriet. And uh, so I put my nose to the grindstone and ended up coming third on the course, if I recall correctly. Um, the guy who came top wanted to go back to Bryce Norton, where he'd been an air traffic controller. So he got, he, ch he had asked for Britannias and he got Britannias. The next guy who came second had asked for Phantoms and he got Phantoms. Uh, and I had put down on my dream sheet uh, Buccaneers and lo and behold, there just happened to be one Buccaneer slot available at the time. And so I was the first RAF student navigator, student out of nav school, to be trained by the RAF as opposed to the Navy on the Buccaneer. So what was your first experience climbing to the back seat of the Buccaneer? Well, um, on the Operational Conversion Unit at RAF Hornington, you, uh, we had to complete 10 simulator sorties, I think, if I remember rightly, I figure it was 10, uh, and fairly intensive ground school of two weeks before we actually flew the aeroplane. So when I climbed into the cockpit for real for the first time, uh, I was quite familiar with my surroundings. Um, what I wasn't quite so prepared for was the experience um, getting airborne in an aircraft with two spay engines that were each chucking out uh, just over 11,000 pounds of thrust. So um, the sensation of accelerating down the runway and getting airborne was a bit more uh, exhilarating than stepping into the cockpit for the first time, having seen it all in the simulator. Okay, my role in the Buccaneer was basically to navigate and um, organize uh, the weapon system. Uh, to do that, I'd got a, a, a blue jacket radar, which i uh, got here on my left hand side by my knee, and a joystick to, to control uh, what I see on the screen um, beside on my right hand side here. On my right hand side, I had a blue jacket um, Doppler navigation system, which gave me um, either a grid position if we were doing grid navigation or a lat and long, latitude and longitude, um, which was a normal operation uh, or my preference. The grid was used by the Navy um, for operating over the sea from the carrier, but generally speaking in the RAF we used uh, lat and long. So the role was to navigate the aircraft from A to B to C to D, find the target, attack the target, uh, and uh, navigate back home. Um, all the weapon system uh, control panels are here, uh, and uh, the bomb equip a bomb distributor was down on my left hand side. So it's a fairly cluttered cockpit. Um, there's not a great deal of room, as I think you pointed out earlier on. Um, but it was comfortable enough and the greatest thing about the back seat of the Buccaneer was that if, when it was designed by Blackburns back in the 50s, because um, it first flew in 1958, when it was designed by Blackburns they had the bright idea of offsetting the two ejection seats. So if you look very carefully, the pilot's ejection seat is offset very slightly to the left and the navigator's ejection seat, my seat, is um, very slightly to the right. Which means as I sit here now, I can see fully forward. Um, uh, and that was a huge boon for navigators because it allowed them, particularly in the maritime game, you could see the ships coming uh, as, and, uh, as you ran towards them to attack them. But more importantly, you could see some of the very um, essential instruments on the right hand side of the pilot's uh, cockpit um, such that if there were any uh, uh, emergencies you had a pretty good idea of what was going on right from the start. Critical were um, the two blow gauges because the, the Buccaneer um, was designed with boundary layer control uh, which meant that air was bled from the engines uh, and, was it, and, and was blown across the uh, wing surfaces to give it better lift and, and more stability uh, when it was approaching the landing on a carrier. Um, and if they failed, it could be catastrophic. So the navigator was able to see instantly if there was a pressure drop in the, in the gauges um, at critical stages of flight, i.e. landing. 
Um, so that was the role of the Buccaneer Navigator, uh, whether it was maritime or overland, I did both. Um, getting the aircraft to the target, managing the, the weapon system, uh, releasing the weapons on the, uh, 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 making sure that the switches were set up properly so that the pilot almost invariably uh, released the weapons on the target uh, and hopefully accurately too and then getting us back to base safely. Could you tell us what a normal sortie was in the Buccaneer? Um, well, it depends whether you're talking overland or oversea. Uh, operating out of Larbrook in Germany, which was my first and last tour on the Buccaneer. I did four tours on the Buccaneer. But um, operating overland out of Larbrook in Germany um, with targets uh, for war, um, Warsaw Pact targets east of the inner German, uh, inner German border, um, sortie length would be anything from an hour and a half to an hour 45 minutes. We didn't do air-to-air -air refueling uh, because the purpose of our positioning in Germany uh, and when you consider the defences that the Warsaw Pact presented to the east of the inner German border, only a fool would have gone at high level. So um, we always went low level and across the inner German border. That was the plan. We never did it for real, thankfully. Um, but the plan was to go low level to and from the target. So the Buccaneer with four bombs in the bomb bay, two underwing tanks on the wing, um, and um, other uh, either electronic countermeasures or um, weapons on the outer board planes, the maximum sort of length at low level would be about an hour and a half, an hour 40. So that was over land uh, without air to air refueling. If you went uh, in the maritime game, with air-to-air -air fueling, uh, well, you can go for almost as long as you like. There was a limitation on the gearbox oil, it would run out after about eight hours, I think. Um, but, uh, generally speaking, operating out of Honington in the anti-surface warfare game, uh, attacking ships, let's say, uh, off the Shetlands or in the Norwegian Sea, uh, anything from two and a half uh, to three hour sortie uh, and if you did air to air refueling out of Honington you might land back at Lossiemouth afterwards, uh, refuel, do another sortie similarly and then back to Honington. So yeah, a sortie length, maritime game, uh, generally speaking two, two and a half hours. Combat. Um, I'm one of those unfortunate um, Royal Air Force officers. Despite my 38 years in the RAF, I um, never actually flew into combat. Um, that's not to say that there weren't wars taking place, but I think you could say I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Certainly on the Buccaneer, um, when the Falklands were invaded, I was in Germany and uh, wasn't involved. Not that the Buccaneer would have been involved in that anyway. Um, when other fracas took place, I was I was not involved. Uh, and again, when I eventually flew the tornado, um, I was about to go to Bahrain uh, to form part of the first uh, aircraft to deploy there after Saddam Hussein had uh, invaded Kuwait. But I was posted to the Ministry of Defence at the eleventh hour to take over from. Um, my boss who had uh, in, in the Ministry of Defence who had already departed for the Gulf to fill in um, an ops planning appointment so uh, I never actually went into combat in the cockpit but I have taken part in a significant number of red flags and maple flags red flag at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada and um, maple flag at Cold Lake Air Force Base in Alberta Canada to I did two Buccaneer um, red flags, two bu uh, Buccaneer maple flags and two tornado red flags, so uh, fair, fair experience. Uh, and the purpose of those exercises was to introduce um, aircrew to the first ten missions uh, of a war. Um, the Americans had discovered after the, uh, during the Vietnam War that uh, they were losing most of their aircrew in the first 10 sorties so they set up red flag to give those air crew or those, those air crew who followed on uh, their first 10 missions in a benign but aggressive environment where they would learn the tricks of the trade if you like 
uh, and hopefully increase their survivability when they went to war. Uh, I went on the second RAF participation in Red Flag in 1978 uh, and it was certainly an eye-opener. We were flying um, at 100 feet and below, um, although the below is probably not legal, so scratch that from the record. Um, but so we flew at 100, 100 uh, feet, about 580 knots. Uh, we even flew with live 1,000 pound bombs uh, to attack targets in the Nevada ranges uh, controlled by red flag. And all the time um, being intercepted by, in the early days, uh, F-5 um, aggressor aircraft uh, and laterally F-16s and F-15s although there have been occasions when I've been chased by F-102s and F-106s of the American National Guard um, who rather pleasingly got a severe telling off um, afterwards for breaking the sound barrier as they tried to catch buccaneers at low level because when the buccaneer first went to Red Flag the Americans had never heard of it, uh, they'd let alone seen it. Uh, we had had American exchange aircrew on the uh, uh, Buccaneer Force, but um, they were, in the si given the size of the USAF and the US Navy, they were um, a very, very, very small percentage. So not many people had heard of the Buccaneer. But they very soon, be, soon uh, realized the capability and the potential of the aircraft, which could fly so low and so fast and deliver its ordnance and survive because very few fighters managed to get a kill on a buccaneer <coughs> excuse me on red flag that we became the target of choice for the fighters if there were buccaneers taking part and the aim of the game for the red force aggressors was to get to the debrief and be able to say proudly i got a buccaneer but very few did if any Well, I became a QWI um, because, for a number of reasons, I, was, I, I enjoyed um, my work in the back seat of the aircraft, I enjoyed weaponry, I had an interest in it, uh, and I had a very good friend who had done the first QWI course that the Buccaneer Force organised, and he was on the squadron, uh, 12 squadron with me at the time, uh, and he recommended me to um, the chain of command. Uh, as to be the um, nominee for the squadron's navigator on the next course. So that's how I got onto the course. The course itself was four months long, summer of 1977, um, and it was fairly intense. Um, when I say fairly intense, uh, the staff took no prisoners. Um, we would start the day about 6.30 in the morning, uh, we would um, brief uh, a sortie, four aircraft would get airborne, was the number two was always the uh, staff crew and one crew would lead it, uh, one student crew would lead it uh, with the other two student crews flying on the wing. Um, we would do various uh, um, operational type uh, activities culminating in weapons delivery on the range. Um, we would also do academic weaponry, that's where you'd just go to the range uh, and, uh, um, and, and drop bombs in the pattern one after another uh, to prove um, you, to prove the system uh, that, you, that you could deliver bombs accurately. Um, so um, I say the day started quite early in the morning, we'd fly the mission, we'd come back, there'd be a lengthy debrief where um, if you've ever been nitpicked in your life, you've never been nitpicked unless you've been on the Buccaneer QWI course because nitpicking was the name of the game and anything that you did that was remotely uh, out of the uh, normal pattern of events uh, would be picked up at a debrief. Um, then the next day's lead crew, with the help of the other crews, would start preparing for the next morning's mission. Uh, and so your day would start at six o'clock in the morning and invariably it would finish at nine o'clock at night. Um, we had no o overhead projectors, everything was done on a chalkboard. Uh, the briefing, the, the, the circuit patterns, every detail of the, of the uh, mission was done on a chalkboard. If you, if you made one mistake on the chalkboard uh, just by extending a line too far or misspelling a word, then you had to rub 
it out and start again. When I say rub it out and start again, you had to clean the board back to its basics, wash it, dry it, and then start again. So you couldn't just rub a word out and rewrite it. Um, it had to be absolutely perfect because the quality that was required of you was to the very highest standard. It was hard work, um, but uh, we achieved it and um, my pilot and I were successful and I went back to 12 Squadron. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the course and, and, and when I eventually got to the OCU, on the staff of the OCU, um, I was selected to be the staff navigator to run the QWI course and that was how I got to Red Flag in the first instance because we took the QWI course, a staff crew, three student crews, to uh, uh, America to Red Flag uh, in 1978 and that was my, that, so that was my first experience of Red Flag as a, an instructor on the QWI course. Uh, my total buccaneer hours uh, are just over 2,200 if I mem remember correctly and I, I do remember uh, it was um, uh, the figure was uh, uh, of that rough order of magnitude um, but my total flying hours were uh, are over 3,000 and um, I do remember that my and up until 2008, my total flying hours were 3,000, th th 3, a couple of hundred, and uh, 50 minutes. Uh, and then in 2008, um, as secretary of the Buccaneer Aircrew Association, I organised a reunion with um, the South African Air Force Buccaneer Aircrew uh, in Pretoria. Um, 120 odd Brits went down to South Africa and joined up with our fellows uh, who are members of the Buccaneer Aircrew Association in South Africa uh, uh, for a reunion and um, I was in South Africa for the best part of three weeks because I'd organised it so I had a fair number of things to I had to participate in everything effectively um, but one of the things that we did participate in was a trip to um, Thunder City in uh, Cape Town at Cape Town International Airport uh, and on our, on our way there we were uh, informed that um, one of us would get to fly in the back seat of one of Thunder City's Buccaneers. We were going there for a beer actually but they decided that because we were, in their words, real Buccaneer aircrew, um, they wanted to fly one of us out of a gesture of goodwill. Well to cut a very long story short, I, I was the one that was uh, whose name came out of the hat but my name came out of the hat because the, of, uh, it, it was only my name that was in the hat. It transpired because my mates uh, had all put my name in uh, in appreciation of the effort I'd put in to get them to and around South Africa. So I flew 10 minutes around Cape Town International Airport, uh, two beat-ups of the airfield at um, 500 knots and about 100 feet with a chap called Ian Pringle, uh, one of the pilots and owners of the Buccaneer at, uh, uh, of one of the Buccaneers at, at uh, Thunder City. And that 10 minutes extra in a Buccaneer brought my 3,000 and however many hundreds of hours and 50 minutes up to 3,000 and so many hundreds of hours exactly. So I was uh, very pleased to have 25 years it had been since I'd climbed out of a Buccaneer cockpit uh, when I climbed into the one at um, Thunder City and it was like putting on an old shoe. It smelt as it had done when I'd first climbed into it. Uh, it looked uh, like it did when I first climbed into it uh, and it was so familiar. It was just a sensational experience. Ten minutes but a very worthwhile ten minutes. Okay, most memorable moments in the Buccaneer. I think they're probably all memorable moments in my, in my Buccaneer career. Um, one sort of particularly springs to mind was uh, we were operating out of Skridstrup in Germany and um, we were bombing on Roma Range and uh, it was March, so it was, funnily enough it's March now, but it was March 1970, probably probably 40 years ago, gracious me. And um, as we came round, we were doing lay down bombing, and um, 
so we were at 500 knots, 200 feet, when running in towards the target, when we hit a bunch of seagulls, and these were not not small seagulls; they were huge seagulls. And the first thing that I was aware of was um, the bang, obviously. Um, and I tried to speak to um, the pilot, but got no reply. Uh, all this is happening, happening, happening in nanoseconds. Uh, got no reply from the pilot. There was blood smeared over the front um, windscreen. Uh, and so I realised that it was going to be this. This could be the first time I'd actually have to use um, a Martin Baker letdown, as we call it. Um, but uh, and the aircraft started to pitch, and it started to roll. And as it was approaching about 90 degrees starboard roll, I thought, now's the time to get out, David. Uh, and I was just about to pull the handle when the voice in the front seat said, it's all right, David, Dave, I've got control. Um, the aircraft was shaking like an absolute demon. Um, but it was still flying, and the Buccaneer's a pretty robust aircraft. Uh, it was still flying, so we headed back to Skridstrup, called an emergency on the radio. Uh, and landed at Skridstrup. When we got back to Skridstrup, it was self-evident that the aircraft had been peppered by seagulls. Uh, the smell in the cockpit of burnt chicken was uh, horrendous, uh, but more importantly, the whole nose cone of the aircraft had been shattered and sheared off, such that um, the, the control and release computer, uh, which is the mechanism that controls the weapon system, which was just in front of the pilot's feet, but behind a, um, a, a bulkhead, uh, the other side of a bulkhead, um, was visible to the uh, eye. So the whole front of the aircraft had gone. But other than that, it was fine. We were fine. And um, we climbed out uh, successfully and happily. Uh, so that's probably one of my more memorable moments in a Buccaneer. But there, there are far too many. 2,200 hours in a Buccaneer. Um, you know, I could reel off plenty. Um, thinking of them is the problem. Um, when you're caught cold by Mike Young. Um, red flag sorties. Maybe the Queen's Jubilee um, when we uh, Queen's Jubilee in 1977, when we were tasked to attack uh, the U.S. convoy that was coming across to participate in the Spithead review. Um, after we'd beat, after we'd attacked them, the uh, captain of the ship asked if we could do a beat up uh, along the, uh, of, of the fleet, and so I was in the lead aircraft with my pilot, and uh, we had five other buccaneers, which we put into line astern behind us. Um, now the target that we'd picked out of the fleet was the USS uh, California, which was a nuclear-powered cruiser. Its fo forecastle, the front of deck um, below the bridge, was completely flat. There were no obstructions on it from, uh, at all, from what I can remember. And so rather than fly along the side of the ship, which we would have normally done on a beat-up, <laughs> we decided to fly uh, from right to left as the ship was ploughing through the waves uh, in the southwest approaches south of Ireland. Um, so we, we pushed the throttles up 580 knots, got it right down on the deck, uh, and as we flew across the deck, I have this vivid memory of looking up at about 15 degrees uh, into, the, into the bridge and seeing the captain looking down at me. Thankfully, he enjoyed it. No signal went back to our base at Honington, and no bollocking was received uh, subsequently. Um, but we had great fun flying the Buccaneer. Marvellous aircraft. Love it. Well, I came on to Tornado because uh, at the end of my four tours on Buccaneers, um, therefore, sort of a good idea if I had a, um, a, a year or two off flying. So I was tasked with uh, writing a 600 page uh, secret manual for the Air Force, uh, which was entitled the Conventional Weapons Employment Manual. Um, I had the qualifications to do so. It was a two year task. Um, and the promise was that once I'd completed it, uh, they would, I would go to Tornado. Um, so I set about it. It took me 15 months to write it and um, publish it. Uh, 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 don't go looking for it on Amazon, it's not there. Um, it's secret. Um, it's probably well out of date now. 
Um, but uh, once that was completed, I moved on to Tornado, and I did my training at um, Cottesmore on Triple T, Tri-National Tornado Training Establishment, in 1985, uh, then to Honington for the Tornado Weapons Conversion Unit. At the same time, I, I transferred my qualified weapons instructor um, ticket from Buccaneer to Tornado, uh, and then was posted out to 17 Squadron at Bruggen in Germany. Having come from the two-seat fast jet environment, uh, uh, the, the training was um, uh, nothing that I hadn't anticipated, uh, and I was I was very comfortable with the um, fast jet operations. The difference was the avionics uh, and the navigational system was far superior to that of the Buccaneer. We'd moved from um, basic av basic avionics um, to digital uh, avionics, and um, the, the, that, that was really the only difference between the Buccaneer and the Tornado. In terms of capability, the Tornado um, couldn't go quite as far as the Buccaneer. Uh, it could go faster in the Buccaneer, but not with a war load. Uh, because it didn't have a bomb bay. So although I've been up to 600 knots in a tornado on red flag, um, that was after the target when the weapons had gone. So yeah, um, it wasn't too different, too much different flying the tornado, learning to fly the tornado, having flown the Buccaneer previously. Other people had, who'd come from the Vulcan force did find uh, the two-seat operation uh, a little bit of a test, but they all succeeded in the long run. So was your role the same in the GR1 as it was in the Buccaneer? Yeah, my role in the GR1 was exactly the same as it was in the Buccaneer. Navigate to the target, deliver the weapons on the target, navigate back from the target and survive. And of course in a two-man aircraft, whether it was the Buccaneer or the Tornado, um, survivability was one of the most important things in a hostile environment. So you had to have your eyes out of the cockpit and uh, we flew formations to ensure that we had good cross cover uh, and we could see virtually through a 360 degree bubble around the aircraft uh, and so to, to make sure that as well as using the electronic equipment that uh, we had to detect attacking aircraft or surface to air missiles or anti-aircraft guns uh, normal air defense um, type uh, stuff but the most important thing was being able to swivel your neck look behind and make sure that your tail was clear how different was it as a weapon system well, well uh, as i've just said a moment ago it was the tornado is much more sophisticated sophisticated um, we've, we've, we've gone from analog in the buccaneer to digital in the tornado um, and so the, system, the weapon system was much more capable of compensating for pilot um, induced errors. It's not a slight of pilots, but um, the, there are, are pilot induced errors, crew induced errors, um, but the, the computer in system in the Tornado was much more capable than the Buccaneer uh, in damping those errors out and making the system far more accurate uh, in weapons delivery terms. And of course, um, when I was flying the Buccaneer, the weapons that were available to us were thousand pound bombs, either free fall or, or drag retard, um, Martel missiles, rockets. Um, but by the time the tornado came along, although we had thousand pound bombs, we were beginning to get things like uh, laser guided bombs. And now, of course, they've got things like storm shadow and brimstone, which are highly accurate and very effective. Um, which takes away a lot of the need for accuracy from the crew and uh, but it also at the same time increases the survivability because they don't have to fly over the target to release their weapons. <laughs> um, first time I went supersonic was not in a Buccaneer, the, the Buccaneer you would not get a Buccaneer supersonic, not in a Tornado, um, but in f F-104 Starfighter of the Danish Air Force when I was on Buccaneers at the time, 
we were on exercise in Aalborg in Germany uh, and, the, and the local air defence squadron there uh, invited us to fly with them uh, and I was very lucky to fly in a two-seat F-104 Starfighter Danish Air Force and um, we went supersonic. What squadrons were you based with uh, in the GR1? Uh, on the Tornado I was based on 17 Squadron at RAF Bruggen in Germany. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I was there for not a great, uh, well, 18 months I think probably, nearly two years. Um, and uh, before I was promoted to squadron leader uh, and I moved from the squadron again using my weapons qualification to become the standards and evaluation weapons officer on the wing at Bruggen uh, responsible for the weapons training uh, both um, conventional and nuclear of the four squadrons that were at Bruggen at the time. Do you have any memorable moments while flying the Tornado GR1? He's at it again. More memorable moments, questions. Um, memorable moments in the GR1. No, no, that's a lie. Um, I think probably red flag in the tornado was pretty uh, exhilarating, but I, I don't even have a thousand hours on the tornado, so it's not as it, it doesn't sit in my memory quite as well as the Buccaneer does. This might be a silly question then, but out of the boat, out of both of them, which is your favourite? It is a silly question. Um, the Buccaneer is my favourite by far. I say that not because um, I've got more hours on the Buccaneer than on the Tornado. I found the Buccaneer to be a man's aircraft. It, um, it, it sits beautifully at low level. It flies at a incredibly good, uh, sustainable, fast speed. It carries a considerable uh, weapon load. Uh, and for the guy in the back seat, you have to work at it to do your job properly. Um, whereas in the Tornado, it doesn't qu sit quite so comfortably at low level. It does go as fast, it doesn't go as far. Um, it can carry the same number of weapons, um, but the system works for you, as opposed to you having to work the system for yourself. So I like the Buccaneer. I, I, in fact, I go further than that. I love the Buccaneer. Yeah, when I, my flying uh, my flying ended in the Air Force um, in 1990. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait um, in the summer uh, of that year, and I was as Stanibal Weapons. I was invited by the Station Commander of Bruggen to select 12 crews to uh, the first 12 crews to deploy to Bahrain to um, before the uh, war. Uh, or uh, before the British in the, uh, participation in the war in Kuwait. So I put myself down as the 12th navigator in the, in the group and uh, trained them and myself up uh, in things that we didn't normally do in Germany like air-to-air -air refueling. Um, but as I think I said, may have said earlier, I was then posted at the 11th hour to the Ministry of Defence in London. Um, that tour in the Ministry of Defence was a training tour in a training desk, uh, looking after all after all fast jet, jet training uh, across the RAF. It only lasted a year because uh, I was uh, then selected for Staff College. When I came out of Staff College, after a short time at Boscombe Down, I was promoted again uh, to this time to Wing Commander, and I moved into a weapons office uh, in London, uh, responsible for. Um, writing and producing operational requirements for air-to-surface weapons for uh, the three services, but the RAF in particular. Uh, in that period um, I had a number of particularly difficult projects to manage, but uh, fortunately uh, we got through all the scrutiny thrown at us and uh, today we have um, the product of uh, those years in MOD in the form of um, Brimstone and Storm Shadow um, operating effectively uh, today. Um, at the end of that tour, um, 
I realised that uh, I was my my advancing years were going to limit the, the how far I would get in the Air Force, and so I opted to go to the RAF College at Cranwell, where I had the most wonderful tour um, for three years uh, in the Department of Initial Officer Training, uh, introducing new uh, of young officers into the Air Force and. Um, uh, setting the, the, their sta the standards for them uh, and training them on a 24-week course at the RAF College. After that, um, the Air Force asked me to um, lead a project uh, that would introduce some air warfare training across the RAF. And with that complete, I retired. <coughs> excuse me, uh, on my um, 58th birthday in uh, 2007. So this is a bit more of a personal side. Do you have any hobbies? Hobbies? Yes. I uh, play golf badly. Um, I've got a chocolate Labrador that I walk. Takes up a lot of my time. Um, I'm a genealogist having researched my family history back to the 1600s. Uh, and I've written a number of um, books uh, or short stories or magazine articles. Um, so yes, I keep myself fairly busy. Um, for my sins, or for for other people's sins, actually, uh, I'm a magistrate in uh, Nottingham. So I'm fairly busy. Uh, and when they say uh, you're busier when you've retired than you were when you're working, I can uh, support that fact. Do you have a favourite tipple? I a good drop of malt will do me fine. Thank you very much. If you're offering, Michael. Do you have a favourite aircraft? <laughs> That's it. Buccaneer. Is there any aircraft you wish you could have flown? Is there any aircraft I wish I could have flown? Yes, there is one. Um, when I was a kid uh, and I'd made my mind up I wanted to join the Air Force, I, uh, my passion was to fly the Lightning. Um, I wanted to be a Lightning fighter pilot. Who wouldn't? Um, but I was a navigator, so that couldn't happen. Uh, I almost got to fly a Lightning when the Buccaneers were grounded once. Uh, we had problems with um, fatigue fa failure in the wing, uh, wings of the Buccaneer, and uh, they were grounded for a period of time, twice in my time on the Buccaneer. And on the second one, a lengthy grounding, um, we were asked what we would like to do whilst the aircraft were grounded. Uh, I said I'd like to go to Binbrook. I said I'd like to participate in the life at Lindbrook, Binbrook uh, uh, and have the opportunity to fly uh, in the uh, right-hand seat of Lightnings. Um, it was all approved. I was getting ready to go to Binbrook when I was rung up by staff at Binbrook who said, who told me that uh, if I anticipated flying in the Lightning I was completely wrong. Uh, I was going to do desk work for six months. So um, I declined. Um, but yes, I wouldn't, wouldn't have minded having a trip in a Lightning once or twice. Do you ever get to any air shows? Um, it's a bit like a busman's holiday, uh, I think, or for air crew to go to air shows. Um, having spent my life going to air shows um, as not part of the crowd, uh, I tend to shy away from them these days. I've got I've got four grandsons, so I can, uh, they're all pretty young at present, but I can anticipate that uh, they will be wanting to go to air shows in the future with Grandad, uh, and Grandad be trolled from cockpit to cockpit explaining um, one switch after another. So I don't tend to go to air shows these days, uh, but I can see definitely that I will be in the future. And finally, do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? No pilot, no navigator ever gets sick about talking about aviation. It's what we did with our lives, um, it's become part of us, um, what better subject to talk about than aviation and aircraft and what it's like to fly them. Okay, well, uh, many, many years ago, um, when I was a young lad, 
on the squadrons, and, and I, I don't think there's a squadron there, of course, that doesn't uh, sing a song or two when they've been drinking. Um, I decided that uh, it might be a good idea to compile uh, all the songs that we'd written or uh, sung over the years and produce them into a book. I didn't do it for any um, anything other than produce a book for my mates, um, but I did produce the Buccaneer Songbook um, uh, in 2008, I think it was. I, I, I seem to recall it. it um, Fell uh, on the same date as we celebrate, or same year as we celebrated the um, first flight of the Buc the 50th anniversary of the first flight of the Buccaneer, which was 2008, 50 years on from 1958. So it's a it's an anthology of uh, drinking songs. It covers all the songs that we sang on the squadrons, but it covers quite a few others as well. Um, there are a few copies still available. Uh, not that I'm plugging it, but uh, Mike Young has asked me to mention it. Uh, the other probably better book um, is this one here, uh, The Buccaneer Boys by Graham Pitchfork. Well, Graham Pitchfork effectively is the compiler of it because it's a collection of stories um, by various people who flew the Buccaneer, both in the, in the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, um, and the South African Air Force. And I was very privileged by, when Graham Pitchfork asked me if I would write uh, the story of what it was like to be in the back seat of a Buccaneer. So that's that. Uh, right now, I'm just finished comp uh, writing a memoir. Um, primarily, I wrote, wrote it for my children and my grandchildren, um, but uh, I've been encouraged to publish it, so publish it I might, um, and I guess um, if that happens, when it happens, uh, details of it will appear on the Aircrew Interview um, website. Um, but right now, um, the title is Secret.